Hey, welcome to the ninth episode of Distributed .NET Core Course. It's Peter and Derek. And today we'll talk about a few useful tools. So at first we'll start with um, storing your credentials, connection string, passwords in a secure and centralized way. And later on we'll go through the um, logging and distributed tracing topics, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, yep. I think that we should start with the very basic question regarding this, uh, the storing the credentials or whatever. So the, the question is why we should care about this? Uh, why we just can't uh, put the credentials like, uh, like I, I don't know, some connection strings or passwords to simply in app settings like we have here? Well, uh, because it's certainly not secure. I mean, even if you are using your internal private repository, for example, some internal GitLab for storing your uh, source code, then again, if you have, if you store, for example, production um, passwords, you know, you know passwords or connection strings to databases that you use in production, you certainly don't want to see, you don't want all of the developers that work on this code maybe to see the passwords to have the potential access to your databases even if there is some firewall in between so what you can do instead um, you could always um, keep these settings on the server side so whenever you deploy your app you could have some environment variables on the server side which is more secure but then comes the yeah. problem especially in the microservices world since you will be having tens, hundreds, or even thousands of instances of your applications, then, uh, you know, s small change maybe to your connection string or to your, you know, private key uh, will <laughs> uh, will occur, uh, it will trigger this, this situation where you have to update all of your <laughs> instances. So that can be quite a lot. Of course, you could yeah. do some scripting here, but it's it can be some it can be it can can be cumbersome uh and i also found out that sometimes people what they do so they use their build server and they use some deployments like maybe octopus and this deployment tool is actually responsible for injecting these correct credentials passwords and other private uh, private settings uh, into these environment variables and it's pretty good but then again, what if you simply change your password and instead of just maybe restarting your application or making your application, you know, call some service to get this updated password, you have to go through the whole redeployment process once again, simply because you change a single value in your settings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say that the, uh, I would say that I agree with this and uh, of course, there are lots of strategies when it comes to storing your your, uh, your secrets or I would say that uh, sensitive data, if you want to call this. Um, and of course, this uh, depends pretty much on a lot of factors because for some people, uh, you can, as Piotr said, you can use some, uh, you know, injecting the dynamic, dynamically injecting the environments variables using uh, using some build servers but uh, of course you could use some external tools like we uh, are going to present to you like vault or if you're using uh, let's say that you're running uh, your microservices on the kubernetes you could use native yeah uh, native uh, secret uh, vault or so this pretty much depends on your uh, on your situation when it comes to to the, to the current project yeah, and again, if you host your services in some cloud like Microsoft Azure or AWS, uh, you can usually find here some tools uh, that will solve this issue. For example, Azure Key Vault. Uh, you should change the path yeah. to from PL PL to you. Yeah, I know it, the translation happens yeah. by default. And it really annoys me. <laughs> yeah. US. So yeah, uh, yeah. The, the Azure Key Vault in Azure. But again, in this whole course, we'll stick to the cloud agnostic tools and yeah. mostly free and open source tools if possible. So we don't want to stick to any cloud provider at all. So today we'll, we'll present you the Vault. And Vault was created and is being developed by HashiCorp, the same company that created Console and other cool tools. And you can use Vault for free. So let's see how we can get started with Vault. Um, 
if you go to our Docker Compose directory, uh, which we updated by the way, so right now the Mongo Rabbit Redis is our core infrastructure. Here is the console Fabio. So if you run the console Fabio Vault, you can see that here we are running this Vault image. Um, so this will run our Vault. So let me just quickly show you how it looks like. It's here. And that's pretty much Vault. You just pull the Docker image called Vault and you run it. And we'll run the uh, development mode. So here is our secret token. Just bear in mind that this development vault mode is not really for the production use. If you want to do the production, if you want to you know, um, deploy the vault to the production, um, you should, uh, you can take a look, for example, into this Docker images uh, file that you created. And here you can find the vault section and under the vault, you can see here there is the vault server and the and a few steps uh, to create a proper proper deployment for the production and by default vault integrates with it can integrate with a lot of different tools a lot of cloud providers and tools databases but by default in this uh, in this scenario it can use the console as a backend so we can use the service registry backend for storing the vault settings uh, if you want in in your production um so yeah but but for this but you know for but the, I, I, yeah. i'm not sure but i think that uh because this is a kind of worth to uh, yeah worth to mention that um things has changed a little bit since we recorded the uh, the episode about the console because now uh there is a new version of the console uh also the pro the service discovery provided by the HashiCorp. so they now turned it to the full service mesh and i think that the vault by default is the part of this service mesh uh, so it's uh, it's probably uh, if you'll go to the console website now um, you'll probably see that uh, am i right that the, the new version was 1.4 i guess yeah yeah 1.4 something or free yeah i'm not sure if all so, it's part of the console service mesh maybe it is if this is the stack, I, I would, I think that I'm not Could quite be. sure, but I think that uh, this See. is now the part of this. Oh yeah, it is part of the service mesh. So yeah, yeah. The, the vault is part of this console service mesh and it's uh, responsible for the, your, for example, um, yeah, uh, certificate um, authorization and management. Nice. Yeah. So cool. uh, yeah, we're, we're, very, we're very unlucky <laughs> that we actually recorded this uh, before they introduced this service mesh. Uh, but yeah, uh, just to let to let you know that if you will, um, if you want to stick to this HashiCorp stack, then you, this will be probably look uh, differently for you uh, yeah. because you'll pro you'll have this uh, out of the box when it comes to service mesh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, the vault uh, looks pretty similar to the vault in terms that is the same type of the um, user interface. And I've just logged using, using this um, token mode, using the secret, which is of course um, our setting defined here. And again, for just to keep in mind, the secret login should be used only by the system root. So it should probably, it probably shouldn't be used by your applications. For the applications, you should use other type of authentication. Let me just quickly log out. Um, so for, for example, for your apps, you could simply define the username and password and make a separate account for each service instead of using the token, which would be really available only for the administrator. And once you log in, you can see that there are different types of secret engines. By default, we'll I use this secret engine, but you can simply create a new engine. As you can see, um, there are quite a few integrations already in place. And you can also go to the access and policies. So for example, in access, you could enable here the new authentication method, and you could enable here username and password or some other um, or some other authentication types, which is very cool. Even, yeah, they have integration with Kubernetes, LDAP, and so on. And you could also go to tools, sorry, uh, to the policies, and you could define different types of policies. For example, user that has this username or belongs to this group can only read these secret settings and so on. So you can define here pretty much everything. But I think, so can, yeah. 
so so this supports creating some uh some hierarchies right in the yeah so yeah say I, that i think that okay. by default what you should you should do maybe at least for starters uh, maybe create a username and password for each of your application, like a separate ones, and then just uh, enable for this, uh, just add these credentials for each service and, you know, set these uh, users uh, to read only mode to this particular, uh, you know, settings paths. And I think that there will be a pretty good right. start. Okay, so let's get into our secret engine. So I can simply click here. And what I can do, as you can see, there is nothing, nothing for now. There, this is just some uh, some path because just like console, uh, you can use the vault using either the CLI, which under the hood will use the REST API, so you can easily communicate with uh, HTTP calls. And I will click click on this create a secret, and here there are like two important things. The first one is path for the secret, and the path is simply the REST endpoint. So I can type, let's say we want to have a secret for our maybe discounts. And uh, let's open the discounts service, our beloved discount service. <laughs> okay, so here in our discount service, we have this um, application uh, app settings. And here I have my uh, section called app. So if I take a look at my home controller, um okay i'm not using it here but maybe i'll use it uh so you can see what's how we can uh you know use vault so let me check where do we have the app options for the okay we don't have it here um but i think that's a no problem because i should be able to simply inject my i options of the App options type, app options. Let's just add references. Oh, sorry. Okay. You sure you did not uh, register this as the single instance without this uh, I options wrapper? Um, probably I could inject it right away, just like this, yeah. I okay. think. But let's just stick to this because yeah, okay. it's the default behavior. Okay, um, so let's try the following. I've just injected my app settings, and instead of returning this hard coded value, I'll return the app options value name. So this one, sorry, should um, return our discount service name coming from the app settings. So let me start the discount service for now. And let's open the base endpoint. So we can go to the localhost 5009, right? And it should load in a minute. Okay, I think we might get some error for the... Yeah, activating particular registration. So it's either not Okay. Wait a minute. Let's see. Yeah, if we had a logger right now, it'll be easier. <laughs> but we'll get <laughs> to the logger part in the next next episode. Oh, um, uh, there's something with open tracing. I see. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. Um, all right. So, okay. Let me just, I think, quickly add the 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 method that we'll use in uh, <laughs> uh in the later part of this episode just to see if that was the root that was the that caused the issue right you think it could be this yeah we have the typo yeah let's see so we'll get to this one uh, in the next part of this episode probably in like 20 30 minutes but let me just add this one package here and one more and one more package coming from a nugget we'll talk about this later so we want to install this package okay and let's go to our mm. src.net add package
I didn't pre predict this <laughs> to happen. No one did. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's get back into our services. Yeah, well. Yeah, but but you see, this is why why you will need uh, monitoring and other <laughs> logging and other cool features, as we'll show you, because you want to, these things to happen. <laughs> okay, and add open tracing. Yeah, I think it will be good now. <coughs> yeah, this should. Okay, one more time. Let's start this up. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so it's 5010. And it should return our discount service coming from the app settings. It did, right? Yeah. You can see that's quite cool. Now let's say I want to change this. I want to change it to be something else. And let's imagine that this is some secret, secret password that we don't want to keep in our repository. So I don't want to steer it here. I could store it in the environment variables, but again, I don't want to do it because if I update my setting once again, I'll have to redeploy my application to all of the instances. So, um, to all of the virtual machines, I meant. So let's try to do it with Vault. And the first thing we need is this uh, secret path. So it can be something like discounts, or it can be like um, discounts dash service settings or whatever this is just a endpoint and now we can either provide a key value here or we can provide a json which is cool so here is our json editor i will just take this um, this small section and because it works you know out of the box with asp.net core you can either override a single section the, all, the whole file or you know just a few parts of it so let me paste the section here and I'll just say that this discounts does service and the default. So I save my um, settings here. And if I go back to my discount services, now as you can see secret, here is my path, you know, the next path for the settings. And if I would like to, for example, you know, update it, I could create a new version because um, by default, and the cons the sort the vault will store the versions of your secrets. So I could update it and you know have the new version of my settings. But let's see how we can actually use this one. So I can keep my you know um, uh, options here that are really uh, they will be really secured, and it's quite simple to get it up and running. We'll go to the uh, program CS, and here I can say use vault. Okay, that's one thing. So if you take a look at it, it what it does, it basically uh, looks for the um, app settings section called Vault uh, that later on will be that you can override with environment variables because you can imagine that what's the point of keeping the Vault password in the app settings since Vault is our credential storage and we don't want to you know, compro compromise it. And so what you should do here, um, instead of keeping it in the app settings, which you, you could always do, uh, you should probably keep it in the environment variable. And then once you do a deployment, you just, you know, assign this, um, assign this vault settings that you can find here under this add vault, vault store. Um, and here are the environment variables that you can use for vault, like URL, secret keys, application types, and whatever you, whatever you need. Because by default, what we do, we just use the um, already available Vault library written for .NET Core. And we just wrap it like we did for most of the tools in the shop common. So that's the one part. The second part is that here, we are using the JSON parser coming from the ISP.NET Core uh, GitHub. So thank you guys for doing this. So uh, what will it will do, it will grab, will ask the Vault store to get the um, settings by providing our key, which is this um, endpoint stored in Vault. We'll load these options, and we'll parse this JSON, and then we'll add this to the memory configuration source, return the build there, so it will be uh, loaded by the app setting, so it will load in by the configuration um, and register here correctly. So the ASP.NET Core framework will be able to, you know, uh, load these settings once the application starts. 
All right, uh, so the last thing to use Vault is to add this um, section. So if I scroll down in, in any of the services, I can again copy and paste. Most of our episodes will be like copy and pasting things. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah, so uh, should, things should work. And uh, let's paste it here. And again, I can just type um, Vault enable true. Here is the URL to my Vault. Then the key. So the key will be uh, the discounts dash service settings. So this is my Vault endpoint and my authentication type. For the demo, I will use a token with secret, but we also added the user pass so you can change the username and password and you can you know, add here more, uh, more application provider on your own. So, but for now, we simply added token and user pass so you can refactor this, our code and make it even better. All right, so let's give it a try. I will start my uh, service discounts once again. And if it right, wants, so so, yeah. so 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 on this on this point, we should be able to yeah yes okay, connect to the to the vault. Had some typo. Yeah, maybe it could be in a path. Uh, let's see, discounts. Oh yeah, I I services. said discount services yeah. instead of discount service. That's yeah, right. Plural. Uh, discount service. Yeah. Yeah, we should be able to co uh, to connect. So let me just quickly fix this. I will get rid of this and update the update the discount service so discount service and do it once again do it okay create a new secret discount service slash settings and paste it all right so at this point what this what this does it simply takes the data from the from the app settings json so uh in this case, you specify that you want to authenticate using this token. Of course, this is for the development purposes. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you're simply searching for a particular settings using this your, uh, sorry, so this key, right? Yeah, this key. Okay. And as the vault for, for the secret. And if it doesn't find the secret, it will fail, as you can see. So right now I have it loaded correctly. And if I refresh this app, you can see that here should come my vault settings. Yeah, that's here. Yeah. So, you know, an easy way and a very secure way to serve credentials. <coughs> and like I said, instead of keeping this here, uh, you can use our environment variables and keep it in the, you know, on the server side. Uh, for example, you could specify these variables in a Docker file and then just update the, you know, just add the correct key on your server. Um, so instead of keeping all of your settings, you should just keep the vault key or username and password on your server side or during the deployment process. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it about vault. And if you are wondering what does, what is this, um, this, um, this IPC log? So for example, what it does, um, it will prevent the vault from swapping your data being kept in memory, you know, secret, you know, in a secured way from swapping into your disk drive, which can be, you know, um, which can be compromised. So log, I mean, Vault has a lot of sec <coughs> security built in. You could also click here on your UI or through the Vault CLI. Here's the CLI, by the way. Um, and you could basically, you know, seal the Vault and then no, no one will be able to fetch any data from it or update it. And only the yes. root administrator will be able to unseal it by passing the, uh, you know, master key parts. So that's pretty cool. And it and works cool. everywhere. So And uh, one, uh, one thing, because I, I don't know whether you specified this uh, back when you explained the whole process, but um, because uh, you specified this whole settings inside this vault uh -huh. uh, under the, under the, some, some key. Uh, and to be clear, the vault uh, the settings are taken from the vault and uh, this section is injected into or maybe this overrides the app settings yes. uh, section. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this happens just uh, when the application is bootstrapping? Yes, exactly. That's how okay. I, uh, how it's done for now. But you, <clears throat> could, you could do it even better. For example, you could imagine that your app might simply, you know, ask a vault 
using the HTTP client if there are new settings, maybe every yeah. five seconds. That's what I. That's yeah. what I want to ask. And then you could have you know this dynamic update, so you would ha you would even have to restart the app. It would just grab the updated settings from the vault automatically. So you could yeah. do a lot of cool so, things so with it, this one. So this this implementation uh, will not update this dynamically. Once you no, change no. this Only, inside the vault, yeah. you will display the 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 version that was provided only during the startup the applications. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's but sense. you can easily extend it. So feel free. Yeah. Okay. Just fork the common package. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's all about the vault. Now let's get into another useful tool for the login. And we'll talk about, you know, this whole idea behind logging, metrics, tracing, and so on in this episode and the next episode. But if you want to start with logging and you are afraid or you don't feel like you need the whole, maybe the whole elastic search stack, or you don't want to use some, uh, some one of these multiple solutions like New Relic, Datadog, Raygun, and, and a few others, that are hosted in the cloud somewhere, you, you you like to use something simple that is just for logging. Um, the pretty cool tool is uh, Secu. So the website is getsecu.net. And, you know, Secu is not really for free. Uh, you have to buy here, you have to buy it. Uh, so it's a one year license. It doesn't co cost that much, but uh, you can use it for free uh, and, uh, you know, for the individual use as a single developer. So they have this free license as well. And you can start the Secu for Docker. So we'll show you how you can use Secu, which is pretty cool logging system. Um, it will, you will send the log to the Secu and it will display this nice dashboard that you can filter and browse your logs. So in order to get started with Secu, uh, you can take a look at our Docker images file once again. And under the Secu section here, you can run it like this. And if you want to assign a volume, uh, you can just simply pass this uh, minus V flag somewhere here. Just make sure that you have the volume uh, with this name on your hard drive or you create a new yeah. Docker volume. So I have my security started. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it will be available on this for, on this port. So let me open it. Five, three, four, one. And before we do any logging, um, let me just quickly guide you for this UI. So here will be the UI. Oh, I, I have some old logs here already, uh, as you can see, that I didn't clean up <laughs> from some previous section. So here are some old logs, and here is the dashboard. So I could go to this this panel, and I could look to some. I could look for some graphs, like all of the events or of the exceptions during some period, and so on. I can go to the settings, which is quite useful. So here I could define the API key. So you can imagine that each of your uh, services would have the unique API key maybe to send the logs. Uh, you can set here backup. Um, you can set the retentions. For example, I could add a policy that will automatically remove my logs every seven days, right? So I don't have to really care about removing it on my own, which of, of course I could do. Um, I can enable authentication. Uh, to this dashboard and what is also cool they have all even the app section so you could you know add some plugins to secu to you know s start you know sending notifications to your slack channels and so on so a lot of cool things there in the um, all right so but let's see how we can actually how we can actually start logging stuff um, okay so uh, let's say we want to add the logging to our um, do you have a yeah. Docker image uh, container up and running? F of Secu? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, it's, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So this <laughs> is local. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of yeah. Okay. So let's say you want to um, have some logs enabled. So I will just say use logging. And again, if you take a look, use logging is our common extension method. So by default, we use Serilog because Serilog is pretty cool. Uh, it's quite performant. Uh, some benchmark says that. It beats the NLOG even like over two times in some scenarios. And it's all about the structure logging, which is quite a nice topic. And the secu, uh, sorry, the serial logs, just like NLOG, log for net, log logging extensions, um, can you know log the data to different and multiple targets, 
like databases, files, consoles, and so on. So for example, here we could look to Elasticsearch, here I could look to console, and here I could look to SecU. So for the simple SecU logging, I will just uh, pass the URL and the API key. And one more thing about SecU, um, if you take a look at the ports, let me just type Docker PS, quite a few <laughs> uh, stuff up running, or maybe just Docker inspect will be better. So if you take a look at the SecU, uh, where was the port section? <laughs> it was somewhere here. Oh, okay. So um, the SecU by default exposes two ports. Um, I don't see, okay. So by default it exposed the 80 port and which is uh, really the UI, which is the UI and the um, this SecU logging system. So this is the port that you can either browse the UI or push logs to, but it also exposes the uh, 5341 port that is that acts only as this you know logs gatherer. So you can only so from your app you could use simply this port and just push the logs. So you don't really have to use the same port as for your UI. You could simply close the access to the UI and just expose this port that will consume your logs that your app will push to this secure. Okay, so here is the uh, use login, which is a serial log and adds these extensions. We also add this enrichment. So for example, we like to maybe have an environment and application name if, um, if provided, um, added to each log. And once again, I'll go to my app settings and simply copy these two things. The serial log section and the sec section. And this is something that you could store in your vault, right? Because for the sec, you could have some credentials like API keys. So that's a good candidate. All right, yeah, this has to be removed. All right, so for SL log, simply stuff. I want to have my console enabled or not. That's up to you. And the min log level. And for the sec, you, um, I simply type this URL and yeah, but like I said, uh, if I expose this private port on the Docker, it will simply act as this uh, log, um, log uh, logging consumer. And my token, given that I set up the API key, or API key for the SecU. And I think that's pretty much it. So let's try to restart our, uh, our discount service. And before I do so, um, let, me, let me try to um, adds to throw somewhere an exception just to see how we can browse through exceptions. So maybe here in this get method, I will try to you know throw, throw some exception. Let's say I will throw in an argument exception uh, like this. Throw new okay. And let's just say we have this. Oops, very informative message coming through through our from our system and let's restart our discounts so it should uh, start logging to the secu and we should also see a little bit different locks on our console window yeah as you can see a little bit different templates using the serial lock we can also see here that we are getting the logs from the RabbitMQ, like which uh, which messages uh, we are subscribed to, and so on. Okay, so let me refresh the page. You can you can also set here the auto refresh. Okay, and yeah, here are the logs, right? The current logs. So I can click on a log and see the details. And as you can see, I have my enriched property visible here: application name and environment which is quite cool, and also some additional logs, for example, from my RabbitMQ or from other from other methods or classes. And let's go into our um, endpoint that will throw an exception. So let's try to um, get some random GUID. I think we should have some GUID in the, the rest, rest file. Yeah. yeah. All right, let me just copy this one, which of course, isn't a valid uh, discount ID and it should throw an exception and on the server side we should just see some you know error yeah 
I enabled here this um, uh, developer exception page, but of course this is something that I would hide on my <laughs> on my production environment. And if I go to the secure ones again and refresh it, you can see we have this dot, red dot, and I can open it, extend it, expand it. And here are my exception details, right? Here is the event ID, which as you can see is an object. This is all about the structure logging. And the cool thing is that I could, for example, browse, you know, the filter my um, my logs here, like maybe application name. So it looks for these uh, properties and I could do application name equals and my discount service vault, right? And it will only, uh, you know, um, filter the logs by these properties. And you can do some pretty nice queries here using Secu. You could also define the, uh, you know, levels for the different logging uh, level types and the queries. So you can imagine that in your, uh, in your solution scenario, you would deploy distinct services and each service would of course use the same name, but it could have the different, you know, uh, instance ID like we did for the console. And in the, all of the services would, you know, would send logs to the SQ, which would act as a common log aggregator. And you could browse all of your services logs through the SQ. And you could also, you know, filter the logs by the services, by the service type, service ID, collation ID, or whatever, using these queries here, or by defining your own signal and queries here on this side. So that's pretty much for the logging. Very, very nice, very yeah. good tool. And as I said, I think I think it was free. To, it's free to use for a single developer. It has the Docker image to try it out, and even for this, you know, enterprise scenario, it doesn't cost that much for this one year uh, as a one year subscription. Yeah. Uh, so we go to the third part. Yeah, now. the final part. So <laughs> yeah, this is the, the fun part. The for fun me, part. I yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, mm, yeah, as a Piotr uh, just shown you. Uh, yeah, so, so, so basically one thing that you can actually uh, add to your application is of course logging and in a lot of scenarios this is great uh, because uh, especially when you have this uh, structured logging it allows you very quickly uh, to see a lot of details uh, that that comes from your applications uh, but there are few uh, scenarios or issues with the logging and the first thing is that you know uh, especially when it comes to microservices uh, if you would see something like you know imagine that you cr try to um, create some command uh, on the API and you put this uh, on your QE and you know later you'll see some exception that was thrown or you simply uh, try to get some data from the API gateway, which then forwards this uh, to some some service that you don't know because it's covered uh, behind this API gateway and you see some stack trace. Uh, it's pretty, it might be pretty hard to determine, uh, you know, how uh, this exception uh, or maybe what was the sequence that actually uh, force this exception to occur. So tracking this through the distributed system, uh, this whole exception could be pretty painful for you. And uh, so that's the first first thing. And uh, I would say that also um, on some level, uh, logging will simply, um, it won't be that, that easy to, uh, to search uh, I would say that if you're new to the, some projects uh, which uh, is based on the uh, microservices architecture and you would try to understand this, uh, it could be pretty hard to, you know, especially when you're new to, to this project, to analyze these logs and understand how this whole, uh, how this whole application uh, is created and how those particular services are, are working with, with each other. Uh, and that's why for some reason, and in some cases you might use also a distributed tracing. And so basically the, the, this, uh, there's a small difference. I would say maybe not the small, but there's a difference between the logging and the, uh, and the tracing and especially distributed tracing. So the logging, as you, as you saw, as you saw, simply 
comes from the particular uh, particular application or particular microservice. And you can analyze this as a whole log, right? So you can see that uh, we have this bunch of logs that came from the last five minutes. And some of them contain some exception that was thrown from the domain or thrown from the infrastructure or whatever. Uh, but you could not easily connect particular events together to see that, okay, so that event uh, triggered another event and another event from an exception while it was processed. Uh, so that's uh, when the distributed tracing uh, comes to play because um, this is something uh, something different when it comes to the presentation and uh, uses kind of different technique that is similar to what we what we've done in a, uh, in a RabbitMQ and a correlation context. Uh, so basically we'll use, uh, as you saw, uh, we had these two extensions and one is a jugger and jugger is, uh, is a tracer developed, I, I think that was de developed by the Uber. Yes, uh, correct. So the Uber had a lot of micro, as you probably expect, have, uh, has a lot of microservices and they wanted to over 2000 track the or even more <laughs> yeah so they wanted to uh, they wanted to easily track the requests that go through the system uh, because for them especially for them logging would be would be a pain because it would be almost impossible to see the dependencies between some some logs from different uh, services so they came with this idea of this uh, tracing system called uh, called jugger and uh, this is uh, this pretty much integrates with the open tracing so this is uh, the open tracing uh, can you go to the open tracing uh, I think it's opentracing.com okay Felix. let's see or the org I'm not sure let's quickly find out yeah, I'm not, I don't know. IO of course it's IO IO okay <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so basically yeah, this is the, as you see, the venture natural uh, uh, tracing that is currently has some, uh, I think that supports nine or 10 languages. One of them is hopefully uh, is, uh, is, uh, is C sharp. So basically, uh, open tracing and the jugger will allow us to add some distributed tracing and to see how the requests go through the whole application. So uh, if you go to the startup CS, mm -hmm. you will see this two, right? Yeah. So we have these two extensions. So we have uh, services at Jagger and at open tracing. And uh, one thing that's worth mentioning, uh, open tracing needs to be installed as you saw on your uh, projects uh, explicitly, it cannot. It, we couldn't put this into common package, and the reason for this is that for now, for reasons that uh, that the contributors explained uh, on a GitHub, because there's an issue uh, on the GitHub about this. Yeah, this one. Yeah, basically, for now, the open tracing does not support .NET standard uh, 2.0. It needs to be Netcore app 2.0. So since we had this common package in a net standard, we couldn't put uh, the open tracing. So Jagger comes, uh, the common package comes with the Jagger itself. But uh, if you want to have some default uh, tracing for ASP.NET Core, you need to install open tracing contrib net core, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. this library that you saw on the beginning uh, for each project. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Uh, maybe we can run some. Oh yeah. Let, so maybe let's run something and then we can go to this methods, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. We'll, we'll see so, how this. Uh, uh, yeah. I we already we already have API up and running. Identity products. Uh, we'll skip the discounts with Jagger for now, right? We can just use something yeah. that has it enabled. And I think if we open the app settings. It has the section here. Yeah, it has sections, yeah. right? So yeah, we're mm -hmm. basically we have uh, some options here. So 
first of course, whether you want to enable Jagger or not, then we need to specify the name for this because uh, th this will allow us to, uh, in a, on a UI, to choose which uh, service you want to trace yeah. or which service was involved in tracing a particular, mm -hmm. you know, flow. Uh, uh, then we have... Yeah. yeah, and I think that you should probably stick to the same naming conventions, whether you're using console, Fabio, <laughs> Dragger, or whatever, because yeah. otherwise you will <laughs> you'll lose your mind when you start. Yeah, try, yeah. So, so the, the, I, th I think that this is uh, pretty much the same. Um, I, yeah, you sure you could this. probably even some more hard code, or just have some something like like we have your app name and then just reuse it everywhere for some injections yeah. or whatever, because otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my. Yeah, that, that, that we could refactor this, but yeah. Eh. Okay, so then we have two uh, two things: uh, UDP host and the port. And uh, the you can communicate with Jagger using either UDP or HTTP. But there is, uh, I would suggest using the UDP simply because there is some issue uh, when you use HTTP. Basically, you have circular dependency because when you send the uh, samples tracing to the jugger uh, it detects itself and trace this once again so this is some weird stuff going on of course you can filter uh, that you don't want to sample uh, data trace to jugger but for for simplicity's sake we'll simply stick yeah. to udp and, and by the way i mean why would you even need the http that you know works on top of the tcp protocol i mean with udp you just send packages and you don't care you don't need really to have this response from jugger whether yeah. your package was received or not so yeah, we, because there's uh, yeah. if you if you're familiar with this UDP, difference between UDP and HTTP, you simply TCP. should know yeah. that uh, yeah, sorry, the TCP you should know that uh, there is no acknowledgement uh, involved. Yeah, nothing like uh, session and so on. So UDP is just for sending data and doesn't care about whether it arrives or not. <laughs> there was a stupid joke about this, uh, but okay, that uh, would be. <laughs> we'll start uh, with this joke maybe the next episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so basically, this is the data, and uh, once you add this add jugger into your startup, uh, if you can go to internals of this add jugger, you will okay. see that. Here. Yeah. So basically, what it uh, what it does, it uh, it takes the section from the uh, from the settings, and uh, simply it builds tracer. And if you'll go, yeah. So it simply takes this. Mm -hmm. uh, options by the key and uh, put this into options. And if you'll see, we need to build a tracer. And for this particular thing, we need two important things. So first thing is the reporter. So reporter uh, is the, I would say the component that is responsible for sending the data to Jagger. And there are plenty different uh, uh, reporters that are built in this library. So you could use the reporter that reports to the console uh, or as you see we use the UDP sender so we can specify the port and the host and so we could uh, so we could uh, send this data to the jugger using the UDP uh, if we not specify the reporter the jugger will simply report uh, to localhost uh, so if you will not explicitly create the reporter will you can simply um, assume that this will report to the local host. Uh, and one question: yeah. Is it uh, is it available like you know, to add some IP key authentication like that simply, or is it Where something like the authentication for uh, for sending for these the... logs and all this stuff? Uh, I think that uh, if you go to the Jagger GitHub, uh, so if you go to Jagger. Yeah, uh, oh. you should go if you go to reporters. Let's see if they I'm have not something quite sure. like this in their docs. Okay. Uh, I uh, see. But there is a but, but there is a section. Reporters. Oh. Okay. Uh, but this is Jagger. I mean the Jagger for the C sharp. Ah, okay, okay. All right. So maybe let's yeah. keep for now. I'll take a look. But. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Okay. For right. I now. think they should have something like this because it's I think quite quite common yeah, topic yeah but uh, i'm okay. i'm pretty sure that they have so that's pretty much the reporter and now we got to this sampler and the sampler is yeah it pretty much does what it uh, what sounds so the sampler simply pretty much samples the data so basically 
you don't want to send everything for tracing because in, of course, for the development purposes, that would be easy uh, and uh, that would not be no, no big deal for your application to pretty much, you know, each request uh, to, to send each request or span will get to this, uh, to this span thing uh, to trace this to Jagger. But imagine that you will have like thousands or, you know, millions requests uh, and that would be painful to report every single uh, request to Jagger saying that, you know, this is uh, this comes for application. So you need to uh, sample this data and uh, you can pick from, I think that there are six strategies, six different samplers. For now we support just three. So first is the const. Uh, so the const sampler simply, uh, this this will simply sample uh, some constant number that was that is, that is picked by the Jagger. Uh, then you can choose the rate, uh, rate limit sampler. Uh, so as you see, this is the max traces per second. So you can specify the max number that will be uh, that will be traced by the jugger uh, per second. And the probabilistic, you can say that let, let's say you want to trace just five percent of your total uh, total requests. Uh, and there are quite. Uh, I think that there are two more. One is. Uh, uh, more advanced because this uses both rate and probabilistic uh, sampler. So yeah, per operation and remote controlled and guaranteed yeah, and, guaranteed and throughput. Okay. Yeah, guaranteed throughput is this one that actually uses. Uh, I think that uses rate limit and uh, and this probabilistic. So basically, once you have these two things, uh, you can create the tracer, and tracer will be uh, later used to. Uh, to create new new spans, but uh, w as I said, we'll go to the span just okay. in a minute. So maybe let's uh, see some locks, yeah, and then we can go to run. the code. All right. So I think the API mm. should already start sending some data. So oh, uh, yeah. and maybe we should start with the Docker. Ah, right, right. Uh, so who would have guessed? In our Docker images. <laughs> <laughs> You can yeah. find this jagger section very down right at the you know you know at the below of the file uh, this file and here is this long command let me just all and z this stuff so it opens a lot of ports on UDP uh, listing on these different you know protocols you don't have UDP <coughs> some ports and in on this port um, you will actually uh, be able to open the and uh, the front end. So let's see. Yeah. And uh, one more thing. Can you go to Jagger page, uh, the official, uh, not the GitHub, but, uh -huh. the, but the page itself? OK, um, the Jagger, this one. Uh, yeah, and the docs and the getting started, I think that was that. And below. Yeah, so basically, the, uh, as, as you saw, uh, that was the command that actually was used. And by default, you can use this uh, all-in-one image, Docker image. So this will create everything that is needed to set up the Jagger locally. Uh, but the Jagger itself consists of few things. So you have this agent, uh, the query, and the collector. And by default, uh, if you can go to architecture now, this will be much clearer. Uh, to the docs of the architecture? Yeah, on the left, you, okay. you should see how this is structured because this will allow you. Yeah. So the below. This one? Oh, yeah. So as you see, uh, this is pretty much how, the, how this is structured. So you have this application and the Jagger client. So in our case, this will be the C-sharp client that reports to uh, that reports to Jagger Collector. Uh, so as you see, this is uh, in Go. And the Jagger Collector then stores this to some data store. And for now, as far as I remember, Jagger supports Cassandra and also Elasticsearch. But if you will run this in this in-memory image, uh, so the one that you will find in our uh, Docker uh, uh, section, then this comes with simply uh, in-memory data store. So once you restart your container, 
you will lost all your data yeah. so <laughs> You can run this separately. Uh, you can separately run the agent and the collector and the UI and the query. Uh, and simply, let's say you want to use the Elasticsearch, so you can just use the Elasticsearch Jagger collector instead of you know the the one you can find in a, in a, in this all-in-one section. So keep in mind that you can choose from uh, different stores. Yeah, I think the Cassandra would make my <coughs> MacBook you know explode. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, that would be something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see uh, some tracing. Yeah, so we have enabled, you know, identity API product service. Uh, in this case, we don't have it yet. So here we have three parts. Maybe let's just take a look at the dependencies. Because uh, did you yeah, do did you do some call to API? Because um, I think not yet. Let's see if I did. Uh, 5,000. Yeah, but you already saw that uh, we had something. Okay. Let's let's make one more. Let's make one more call to my products, which will return the empty empty product selection. <coughs> okay, and let's get right. to the Jagger. So maybe we should start with this or just with these graphs. Uh, we can start with the API. Uh, yeah. So let's select the API okay. and just. Find so traces. here are our services grouped by their names, yeah. which is the uh, upsetting key. In the jagger, you know, some different uh, filters, yeah. tags, which can be quite useful. And yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. show you how you can actually filter. This is pretty cool, filtering by operation type. Yeah. So as you can see already, for example, uh, sending the HTTP GET or POST, <coughs> uh, whatever is the general method or uh, for the particular controller, let's just click on all and find traces. Wow, 11 right, traces, so nice. Okay, so we, we had something and uh, I think that we should start with this. Can you just, uh, we should start with this uh, just f uh, API uh, home controller, just to see the, the home basic. controller. That was the, yeah, I think that was this one. Mm, I think it will be uh, the above, above uh, this one. Wait, I guess. Yeah, yeah I okay. think. Yeah. Okay, so this is how this tracing. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is how this uh, look like. Uh, so basically, if you will, uh, if you will see, we have this. I don't know. This is uh, what color is it? This is the something between the blue and the green. I guess I'm not that good this in the color. Sort of this C color, which I don't know how it's called <laughs> in English. All right. So but ba ba let's call it green. I call yeah uh, yeah. It's, I, I don't know whether this is green or not, <laughs> uh, but let, let's let's say that this is a green. So as you see, uh, we have this uh, green rectangles, uh, and each of them, rep yeah, okay, bars. <laughs> each of them represents span. So I would say that the span is a crucial unit of the tracing. So in a nutshell, Sorry. span represents a unit of work. So you're, imagine that you want to get some data like we did. So th that was the request done by the Piot. So we can have plenty different uh, unit of work and the connection or the relation between them could be either that one follows from the other or that the one span is the children of the other. So in this case, we have this children uh, hierarchy. So this very first span is the HTTP GET. So if you'll go to the top. Yeah, I think we can right. also browse it like this, right? It yeah, this is the alternative view. Yeah. So this is the first span, uh, but this will not oh, okay. look that good when it comes to the hierarchy. Okay, so correct. if you click on this first one. Uh, on you mean below, here? Yeah, yeah, here. So this is the whole span that uh, that you can that comes from this open tracing. So this pretty much uh, gives you the basic tracing for the ASP.NET Core. So you can see pretty useful data here, like that we called the local host 5000, and who called this? Uh, so in this uh, this this case, this is the Piot, who's the host name, and that's the basic unit of work, right? So this span represents the lifetime of our request from the very beginning of the ASP.NET Core uh, 
request lifetime to its ending okay mm -hmm. but besides that besides that we have also a children's span so in this case you can see that we have a children's span which refers only to the asp.net core controller so this does not involve anything oh you see yeah that we have even the whole life cycle much... that's pretty cool yeah because uh this plugs to the whole life cycle so you can see that we have print plenty different uh action filters so that you, you see that this is before action executing after and so forth but this is uh this sticks to this particular uh lifetime so only mm -hmm. to the sp.net core and then uh the another child the last one of this yeah the last one is returning the result which will had the separated span right and this mm -hmm. took seven and yeah over uh the seven milliseconds so as you see you can visually see the whole requests so this is uh, i would say that yeah in some cases this is uh, much easier to understand how uh your application lives and how this uh, whole application is structured and how particular services talk to each other uh, instead of analyzing the logs because imagine that now we would have as you see one span has multiple logs inside this is also pretty good cool feature that span can be either tagged so we can filter them or and you can also put a logs inside uh, the particular span and imagine now that you would have 20 logs that corresponds to different lifetime and then you have some okay object result and it will be kind of kind of hard uh, to uh, to see how this uh, how this goes and this is also one more thing that is I would say the crucial and this is the main advantage of the tracing over the logging if if you um, go to the logging and you know this is pretty mm -hmm. easy when it comes to uh, when it comes to production uh, sorry to the development because there is or there's a uh, not that high chance that you will have a lot of ta of uh, logs but imagine that you will have like thousands of requests on the production and you would you would like to lock something because maybe there's some issue you want to investigate you would have like in a just a few seconds you would have a lot of logs to analyze and of course you can filter them but you know this keeps changing but uh, things are pretty different when it comes to tracing because each trace has its own ID so you can see that in tracing you will see only uh, things that were actually related to this particular uh, to this particular action and nothing more nothing less so even though you would have like 5,000 requests right now it still would be pretty easy to find this particular trace and then analyze it very easily because there would be no unnecessary data uh, around here mm -hmm. uh, yeah so that was the uh, so, so that was the um, first demo right so we simply queried the yeah the home controller and this is getting more interesting right now and it shows uh another thing so what Piotr did was calling the api gateway and api gateway then called to uh, call the product service mm -hmm. for some products even the whole query so, in url is here yeah so we can first inspect what data was sent to this particular microservice from the API gateway but you also see this connection between your uh, b between your services so you can see that uh, now I think that we could show this graph dependencies, diagram right? because oh yeah okay, we can sh show the dependencies so this one is so always first, so far away I don't know why I don't know why and it's it's difficult to actually scroll it at least for me so it's a little somehow buggy maybe let's go to the other one <laughs> because this one actually is a little bit weird and it's very far away <laughs> so I let me just you, refresh this <laughs> i'm lost somewhere in this site okay where is my where are my dependencies okay 
So this for <coughs> this uh, for the graph is is you know this um, direction between the f this flow, right? Like yeah, two services. I think that the but is, I don't know why it's so far away. Sorry, this is probably some is JavaScript issue. Yeah, yeah, this one is better. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this one basically shows you dependencies in your system based on HTTP calls. So you see that so far since we started tracing, API called products three times. Yeah, we did. We opened these endpoints two times before, and now we open it once, so it's three times. Yeah. Now. So yeah. So this counts the whole. Uh, yeah, the whole number of the of the tracing collected by the jugger, uh, but I would say that this for for just for this feature that is awesome because of course this is a very uh, simple that was a very simple example when the API called the products but imagine that you will have that multiple calls to different services and simply by clicking on the dependencies and tracking this uh, tracking this spans and the the whole this whole tracing you would see the dependency graph just for free and uh, with not much uh, trouble. So if you're new to the project, you could simply, and assuming that you have the jugger, that would help a lot to understand how this uh, data flows through your system. Uh, and okay, and can we get back to this uh, search? Mm -hmm. Which one should we choose? Products uh, or? Yeah, we can, we can switch to products so if we'll switch to products this will show only uh traces in which product service was involved so in this case if you go to this get you could see that we had we had uh this call so basically as you see we had this get method that started from at the above in the api then we called the product controller and then we did another a uh, HTTP get which involved this time yeah you can see that this called the products underneath and we had the same thing for the product so we have whole span for the for the products then we have products controller result okay object result and then we have another okay object result for the API so this is super easy to understand how the data flows through your system and of course, this allows you also to see where some to spot some bottlenecks because imagine that you would have uh, huge times some latencies, yeah, or whatever. yeah, some latency, or you would simply want to, you know, you would have some spans over the let's say that one span, so this one unit of work would uh, wrap your connection to the database. So then you would see, let's say in this on this UI that, okay, my whole request took one second, but for some bizarre, bizarre reason, uh, we waited half second for the result from MongoDB or from, from Redis. So you could spot easily bottlenecks and which could be not that easy when it comes to logging. So this is uh, also a great thing. And this is how you can uh, basically search for this. So. I would say that uh, if if you want to trace your data uh, and using only HTTP, uh, then I think that there is not much to to change uh, in a default C# -sharp client because this is also important. Tracing is pretty much about the HTTP, and of course, since we wanted to also make it even more cool. Uh, then we integrated this also with RabbitMQ. So let's let's uh, make a request. Yeah. Let's make two requests. The the first one will succeed. So in the first request, we'll create a new product. <coughs> so yeah. let me just log in as administrator um, here. Do you have a sorry? Do you have a token or something? Oh uh, yeah, I think I click this sign in, but I'm I'm not sure if okay. Yeah, the, the first one is always the longest, given that we are recording and so. It took twelve seconds to get the access token. That was no, it was <laughs> yeah. That's the power. Okay, I'll see and let's post to these products, which is here. 
Ah, sorry, this one. So this should create a new product. Okay, and now I'll post it once again. So we should try to create a new product with the same name, which is not unique, and it will fail. Of course, we will not see the failure here. And let's go back to Jagger. And find traces for products once again. Sorry, search. Yeah, I would say that this is another advantage, yeah. actually. Yeah, because uh, re just keep in mind that we return accepted even though we, yeah, because this is what the message says. We accepted the message, but this does not mean that the was actually processed successfully. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you will see that so this is the first we one, have, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think so. Oh, no. Uh, because this is the limit uh, just to the post. Yeah, this was this was the, as you can see, this was uh, this was the secu, uh, the yeah. cell lock pushing lock to the secu. So you should probably filter it out. So yeah, yeah. And this one. Uh, no, I uh, think uh, the one below. Um, okay. Ah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Be I forgot about the API. <coughs> yeah, that's that's right. cool. That's cool because the API send the original request, which makes sense. Yeah. So as you see, uh, this is pretty much uh, this is very similar, but this does not comes out of the box. So uh, as I said, the tracing is based on the HTTP, and since we push the data to the RabbitMQ. Uh, Without any additional work, you would simply see that the trace would end at the third span. So we would simply return accepted and that would be yeah. it. And to propagate this data through the QE, uh, we did some small work, but uh, just before we did, uh, we'll do this. You can see that we some- There are even logs, logging. right? It's cool. Yeah. So we logged this, that we had some correlation context and we uh, yeah, processed some command, in this case, create product. Mm -hmm. So I think that we can go to the code and see how it's done. To basically. our middleware, right here? Uh, no, I think that we should start with the, with the API. Oh, because right. That's, that makes sense. So let's go into base controller of the API and it accepts now this eye tracer. <clears throat> yes, yes. So uh, as, uh, as you remember, uh, iTracer was created by this at Jagger extension. So we, so the tracer uses sampler and, uh, and the recorder for, for the, uh, for the tracing. And now one thing. So as I said, there was an issue that since the Jagger is based on the HTTP and the tracing itself. So once we would send the accept that would end the trace because you know how Jagger would know that he needs now to start start tracing. You know the this particular microservice. So we simply put this on the QE, and let's say it let like within the three minutes it would be uh, processed by the microservice. And how how the heck he would know that he should trace this as a one uh, as a one request or the data flow. So for this, we use our correlation context. So as you remember, correlation context is a metadata that is attached to the message uh, in RabbitMQ. So now we have this additional field called span context. And what, it's, what it does, it simply takes the, from the tracer, takes the active span. So span uh, in this case would refer to the span that is within this controller. So, uh, as I said, you had three spans. One was the whole request. Then we had a uh, nested span, which was just the ASP.NET Core. And the third one was the OK result. So this active span repel re refers to this uh, ASP.NET Core uh, unit of work, let's say. And we simply take the context. We context contains all the data necessary for Jagger to know that Later, lately, we want to attach this to uh, to the current tracing. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we have some some internal skill. Uh, so basically, what it, what we do, we simply uh, I would say that they serialize, but they have this two string overloaded. So basically, 
it's uh, we simply take this context, put it into the string, and the this context is kept as a string in the correlation context, and then it is sent to publish to the QE. So then, uh, one thing, if you will go to the add jugger, yeah, is if you uh, if you see we have this use jugger uh, that. I think that should make this internal. Now mm -hmm. I see. Ah, okay, I'll change this. Uh, so basically, we have this jugger stage middleware, and this is the uh, this is the middleware for the Rabbit MQ. So for the raw Rabbit you, library, actually. Uh, sorry, sorry for the raw Rabbit. Uh, so basically, raw Rabbit has the very similar, um, I would say, the similar structure to the uh, to the ASP.NET Core. So it uses the pipeline and the middlewares for processing your messages. And of course there are different steps. So if you see there is a stage marker that says that this middleware uh, will be called once we deserialize the, uh, the message. And if you're familiar with the, with the middlewares in ASP.NET Core, then this is pretty much pretty sim similar thing. So basically we call you know, the next, a invoke, next invoke async and so forth. Uh, so the next refers to next step in the uh, in the whole pipeline. So basically now what we do, uh, we get the correlation context using this get message context, and then we take this span and span uh, span context can be restructured using this span context from string, and this gives us. Uh, I would say that the, this gives us this connection between the API and a particular microservice. So this refers to this, uh, let's say, ASP.NET Core span from the API gateway. Now what we do, uh, we simply create uh, a scope which gives us another span. And this span is, a, if, if, if you'll see, yeah. So we simply say, okay, I want to create new span and uh, this will be called processing and then some message name. Uh, we want to give him a tag. So a message type would be either command or event. Uh, so, you know, if message implements I command, this will be command and, you know. Uh, and then we want to add a reference. So as you see, we have this reference follows from. So we say that, okay, this is another span. This is another unit of work. And we want to refer to this uh, to this span context that you just deserialized from the from the correlation context. So you would know that this is the next step of this processing data. Okay. So you, Jagger would know that okay, this is uh, that this is something that should be attached to this uh, to this tracing from the API gateway. And then we want to activate this. Uh, the start active does the thing that. Once we quit from the using, this will dispose the, the span and they will finish this. And inside this uh, using, you can see that we simply invoke async. So invoke async basically would call uh, our bus subscriber and this will, inside this invoke async, we will put everything uh, that you're familiar with. So that contains basically the the bus subscriber and the calling the particular command handler or so, or event handler. Yeah, this, this and, stuff. Yeah, okay. And so that was the, uh, I would say, general span for this, uh, for this uh, microservice. But we can go even deeper. And as you see, uh, now we are in the bus subscriber, which will be called after we create this, uh, this span from the middleware. And here, uh, as you see, we have building, we're building another uh, spans, but this time it's the child of the, our current span, okay? So, uh, yeah, so basically we create a new scope, new, new span, and uh, this is uh, now the child. And this wraps the whole uh, executing of the handle async. So if you go to, you'll see that we have then logging to logger mm -hmm. and we also can log to span. Then we do await handle, which actually calls the command or event handler. Uh, and then we, yeah. And then we simply 
and the span and one more thing for exceptions uh yeah if we have the exception we can also log that we had something and we can also set tag and if you see uh jagger comes with some predefined uh predefined tags uh, as the enums yeah so if you go or oh, not sorry it's not the enum it's a uh, some oh, static quite a lot. Okay. yeah const constraints so basically if you set the error to true uh you you can dynamically add the tags to spam this will be displayed on a ui as a span that actually failed and so when we have the catch close you will see that this actually failed mm -hmm. Uh, so this will allows us to analyze this even more efficient. And uh, just last thing, uh, if the error was of type dshop exception, then this means that the error type was the domain issue. And if this is the, the, this was not the dshop exception, then it means that it came from the infrastructure. So maybe or our, you know, there could be some. It doesn't have to be exactly infrastructure, but this could be some stupid mistake. Some application like, you know, logic stuff, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. So, okay. So we can see now how this looks. Okay. So it was uh, this success. And now let's get back to the this error. And yeah. yeah, we have this nice icon there with exclamation mark. Yeah. So as you see, the first processing create product, that was the uh, span that was... Yeah, the product uh, was created in a middleware and this child was created in a, a bus subscriber. And since we hit the catch, then was the filtering that says, okay, that was the dshop exception. So we mark this as an error and also as a domain error type. And we could uh, put some data that says that mm -hmm. the product was already exists. And uh, last thing i think that we could show this exception. a retry right yeah the retry all right so let's because do something stupid <laughs> yeah yeah so let's throw an exception here just like we did before which doesn't really make much sense throw new argument exception and again our oops yeah and let's restart. It was supposed to be the products. Uh, yep. Okay. And let's try to create a new product once again, and we should get an error after three retries. So yeah, because uh, just remember that. Uh, the whole handling the message of the message is wrapped by the poly mm -hmm. policy. Damn it. Yeah. By the in this case, yeah, we want to retry a few times. Oh, four errors. Uh, right. So yeah, as you can see, we have the retries, right? So the infrastructural yeah. error type with this custom tag, and we're trying to create a product <coughs> and then we have our event. Oops, so there's yeah. an exception, another retry. You can see retry, another one, and so on. Yeah, so basically we... But interesting is that uh, we have retry one, three, and two. Like, it was not ordered somehow. This, this is interesting. <laughs> huh? As you can see, look. I don't know why. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of Maybe it just show, I don't know. But, okay, as you can uh, see. I don't know why. But on the graph, it uh, can you? Yeah, just let me check. Okay. Oh, okay. Hmm. That's kind yeah, of yeah. That's, that's interesting. Work, yeah. So basically, as you see, we had this one uh, processing create product, and that was the span that was created artificially in the middleware. And then inside the bus subscriber, we created a child spans. Each of them uh, tried to handle, uh, to execute the handler. But since we failed and we got this exception, Polly tried to uh, try again and tried four times. 
and then uh, just get rid of this. So mm -hmm. that's why you can see four failed spans, or maybe not failed, but the spans marked as error. So uh, this is also clear that something went wrong yeah. with your app. And that's think that's pretty much it when it comes to tracing. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think that you should get the difference between uh, between the logging and the and the and the tracing. Um, I don't know whether we have something else. No, it's, I think it's more yeah. than enough, anyways. <laughs> but uh, we'll yeah. we'll explore these topics of these monitorings, metrics, and so on in the next episode as well. So this is not the end of this <laughs> of this stuff. Uh, yeah, and the next episode we will talk about the Prometheus, Prometheus, and, uh, Grafana, and maybe something else. We'll yeah. see. But it will, in the next next episode, you'll see how you can how you can actually um, um, collect some metrics, some custom metrics or some built-in metrics, and how you can display a pretty nice dashboard with a lot of you know graphs, panels, statistics being updated in real time. So you'll yeah. you, you'll be able to really build an uh, an awesome admin DevOps panel and you know just plug it into Whatever, some yeah. some TV big big screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then show how busy you are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm taking care of my microservices. <laughs> yeah, but this is a pretty handy stuff. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think the general uh, general thing is that you should start to think about logging monitoring, <coughs> you know, tracing and all these things before you uh, deep, get into yeah, before before you start deploying your s microservices on a, like a big scale, because uh, you can have the best domain, best services in the world, but you shouldn't ask when, uh, you shouldn't ask if that happened, but you can be certain that it will happen. So you should ask when my service or services will go down and things will, you know, start breaking because it will happen yeah. anyways. And if you don't have these tools in place, then uh, it's like you will see the fire and you will, you will send, you will, you know, send the smoke, but you will have no idea where, <laughs> where is it burning? <laughs> so it yeah, might hurt. That's a pretty serious, uh, I would say that this is pretty serious because it's, it's like, you know, the people tends to think that, um, especially when they have really poor logging like okay i have some logging i, I, I will I'll to, to the files to, to file yeah to file or to database and then where of, co of course the database is way better because you can query this but the, you know logging to, to to know to some text files is like okay so good luck with this especially when you will have like thousands requests a second then we'll see you know how how easy it is to to spot the the issue in your infrastructure, so so as Piotr said, you should not think that uh, yeah that uh, whether this will happen. It will, but just when. <laughs> just when. Yeah, I think uh, just uh, one more thing. We we uh, we've had recently very good presentation actually about this kind of approach. It was I I know how this translates, but it was something like the chaos engineering or something. Mm -hmm. So basically, that was developed by the Netflix and. Uh, the Netflix created the whole stack of the tools for breaking the, their infrastructure on the production. So let's say that you have the Kubernetes cluster that runs uh, you know, multiple instances of your microservices and you simply, I think that they call this monkey of chaos, chaos something monkey. like this. The chats down chaos some monkey, services yeah. randomly. Yeah. So you simply enable this and you don't know when this will shut down half of your infrastructure and using this netflix yeah uh developed great resiliency when it comes to their microservices because they are prepared for different situations and uh and the different uh yeah stuff whether this is the application or the infrastructure so yeah, yeah. if you're interested more in this stuff then you should definitely check this maybe we'll link this in uh, some comments or something we'll see yeah Chaos Monkey Netflix, yeah. Okay. It's the whole, uh, yeah. Oh, it's this Simon Army. This yeah, is the whole. That's the whole famous stack. topic. <laughs> okay, so I think it's we are good for today. It's been one yeah. and a half hour 
already. Yeah, again. So, <laughs> good time. All right, so see you in the next episode, which will be at episode number 10. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you and uh, yeah, bye. bye.